unmute your microphone. I, I don't know what Elder Ashmeet has in mind here, but but he told you that I am speaking on the duress. Uh, and, and now using the dark shades, I guess you understand what my duress is, right? So so I can't see you, so I need to hear you. So it's okay if you unmute your mics and talk to me. That way I know that I'm not talking to myself. I'm, I'm standing in a room with a, a large screen in front of me, and it has a screen reader, which, which will tell me what's on the screen, but it, it really doesn't describe what you look like, you know? So you got to talk to me. Is that okay? No, no, nobody saying a word. Yes, yes, have, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. serious. You can, really unmute, you can really unmute your mics and talk to me. That's all right. All right. You know? All right. Okay. Um, I, I suffer from some disease called Fuchs dystrophy. Some German doctor called Dr. Fuchs in, um, came up with this thing called Fuchs dystrophy, uh, which means I have a disease of the cornea, uh, the corneas. And so we're, we're waiting for this COVID thing to be over, then they'll drag me to the hospital and, and give me two replacement corneas. And then I'll get to see again. Amen. So, so in the meantime, you know, we just do this thing here, and and so I, I typically use PowerPoints. I I I, I can make things out vaguely if they're at least twenty point font and larger. <laughs> so I, I I put them on this large screen, and we got a program called Jaws, which will screen read for me and shoot this to these things you see on my head. And, and I'll know what's there and I can pretend to be reading. <laughs> it's fun, it's fun, it's fun. Life is good, technology, we've come a long way, right? We've come a long way. But I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I'm, I'm happy to, to pretend to be in Stamford, Connecticut once again. I was interviewed for a job in Stamford many, many years ago. Seems like centuries when I graduated from law school. There was a firm there, used to be called Deloitte and Touche. I think they're called something else now, but they're a big tax firm. And, and they interviewed me for a job and actually made me an offer. It was quite a day I got the offer from Deloitte and Touche. I got four offers on that day. Imagine that. And I, I turned down Deloitte and Touche, reluctantly turned down Deloitte and Touche because on the day that they called me was the same day that the New York State Court of Appeals called me. You do not turn down the New York State Court of Appeals, especially when the dean of your law school recommended you to the New York State Court of Appeals. So I turned down Deloitte and Touche and then realized that man proposes, a God disposes, you see? B because about one year, you know, le a little less than one year, after I turned down that, that offer from Deloitte and Touche, uh, a couple of idiots took two planes and, and, and flew them into the World Trade Center, which is where mm. I would have been working. So if I had taken that offer from Deloitte and Touche, you would not have me here today, you see? Have mercy. Man proposes, God disposes, you see? Amen. Yeah. So I, I think about that and said, we have a great God. Right, he Amen. makes a way. He leads us all along, doesn't he? I, I thank my my friend John Ashmid for having me come here today. He didn't tell you that he's my supervisor, did he? We worked <laughs> together. You see, he, he hid that part from you. We worked together in religious liberty. I'm the religious liberty director of the New York Conference of Seventh Day Adventists, and and John, of course, is the associate director of the Atlantic Union Conference. He didn't tell you that, right? <laughs> So he's uh, actually my boss, you see? <laughs> uh, he hid that from you. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm here reporting to my boss today, and, and if I mess up, then he's gonna hold it over my head and say, you silly man, you, you messed up, you know? Because he's my boss here. So I'm, I'm here to speak uh, at my boss's church, and I, I hope I don't mess up. Hmm? Mercy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I look nervous, you know why. We propose to speak today on, on, on the topic, speak, oh Lord, power to the people. This is Black History Month. Speak, oh Lord, power to the people. And let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. 
oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And now take Vaughan James, this man of clay with great big blundering feet of clay, hide him behind the cross of Calvary. Let your people see Jesus. Let your people hear Jesus. And at the end of our time here, O oh God, send us home rejoicing. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, and let the people say with me, and let me hear them say, Amen, amen. and amen. 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 Now I'm going to share my screen with you. I have only good things on my screen, don't be afraid. Okay. We'll pull the screen up. All right. That way, you know, my screen really can tell me what's there. I've got to thank Dr. Ted Serran for singing for us this morning. Dr. Serran and I, we go back a long, long way. I started preaching this gospel a long, long time ago. <laughs> In the days when we used to do things called preach crusades. Do you remember what crusades are? Mm -hmm. You guys still do crusades? You know, we used to do crusades and crusades used to go seven weeks. Seven weeks preaching five nights a week. We would take Thursday night off so we could prepare for the Sabbath, you see. And, and we would take Saturday night off, we took two nights off. But, but, but five nights a week, we would preach for seven weeks. And, and Ted Sarah was part of my team, you know, doing special music. Yeah, he and, and Vernon Alexander and Vince Alexander and that group, we just had a tight group together and we'd go around preaching crusades. We started this thing a long time ago <laughs> and we're still together. So, so when I go to preach, I got uh, Ted Serran, his doctor Ted Serran now lives in Houston, Texas. Uh, and he still comes out to sing for me. He, he knows me so well. All I have to do is get the sermon together and send it down and say, Ted, pick a song. And, and he picks a song. I don't have to tell him what to sing. I just have the sermon and he gets the song together. <laughs> That's what happens when you work together for a long time. You have your Bibles with you, right? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Uh, All right. You have your Bibles. Let's open them to John the 13th chapter. That's our text. John the 13th chapter. And we're beginning on verse 31. Jesus is speaking. He has his disciples together with him. It's a Thursday evening. And, and they've eaten some food. And having eaten the food, they're sitting there talking and uh, and John relates to us what's, what's happening. And John says, therefore, when he was gone out, he being Judas Iscariot, when he was gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway, he said, and I think I went too fast, so my screen reader lost me. Uh, but John <laughs> continues, little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, wherefore I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, now listen carefully, now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, uh -huh, that ye love one another. Mm. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Listen now. Jesus speaking. John is recording. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Mm. Oh, oh. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. We, we, we'll talk more about that later on this afternoon, right? How much time do we have, Ella? As much time as you want, Pastor. You, you, now you got to be careful about that, right? <laughs> I, I used to do radio ministry in St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. I, I would turn on the microphone at five o'clock in the morning I'd get off the air at 10 o'clock in the morning. You understand? Amen. That's five hours. <laughs> be careful when you tell me take as much time. I would be on for five hours. And people would turn the radio on. Back then, they called me Ed Shaker, the morning waker. 
you know? Mercy. And so when you tell me take as much time, be careful. We might be here for five hours now. Because uh -huh. lunch ready for us? No, everyone's <laughs> at their own home, right? So they can go get a snack and come back, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> What we'll talk about this later on, maybe in our number four. By, by, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Now, Jesus made that statement, I just told you, it was a Thursday night. It was the last week of his ministry on planet Earth. Hmm. That week had begun on Sunday, Sunday hmm. morning. Jesus was on the mount overlooking Jerusalem on Sunday morning. And the people decided to have a donkey cade for Jesus. It wasn't a motorcade. They had no motor. It was a donkey. A donkey cade. They put Jesus on the back of a donkey. And they removed their cloaks and removed their tunics. And they put these things on the ground and allowed Jesus on the donkey to ride on their tunics and on their cloaks. And while Jesus was doing that, the people broke the palm branches. We call that Sunday Palm Sunday. They broke the palm branches. By the way, they needed the palm branches to protect them from the burning sun. But they broke the palm branches and began to wave the palm branches. Mm. And while they were waving the palm branches, they began to chant. You got to understand something about chanting. If you have a cause, you develop a chant. Mercy. You guys understand that? Yes, if sir. you have a cause, you develop a chant. I say it a third time so you guys can get it ingrained in your heads. If you have a cause, you develop a chant. And Mercy. the people in Jerusalem that Palm Sunday morning had a cause. They were fed up with the hypocrisy of the Sanhedrin. Fed up with the legalistic religiosity of the Pharisees, fed up with the traditionalism of the Sadducees, fed up with the legalistic theology of the scribes, fed up with the oppression of the Romans. And they thought Jesus the Messiah was going to overthrow the entire system. And so they were hopeful. Jesus the Messiah was coming. Things were going to change. Uh, and so they, begin, they began to chant. And what were they chanting? Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. They were actually quoting the 118th division of the Sabs. Yes, sir. What does it say in Psalm 118? You guys know that, don't you? You are good scholars of, of religion. Ooh, let me go here. I call it the Hosanna chant. <laughs> the Hosanna chant. And that Hosanna chant that they were quoting from, from, from the 118th division of the Psalms, where it tells us that the Lord is good, right? The Lord is good. And what does he do? That Lord who is good, his mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Me? Amen. I Amen. said you can un 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 unmute your mic and shout. You know, that's okay. People don't get quiet at church. At least black people don't. Have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> so, his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his what? Good. Come on now, church. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy does what? Endure. Endures forever. Hosanna, Hosanna. The people are waving their palm branches. They have a chant. Why do they have a chant? Because they have a cause. They're fed up with the oppression, fed up with the hypocrisy, fed up with the legalism. They see hope, and because they see hope, they're chanting, and they're chanting the Hosanna chant. And Jesus is coming down the, the mountain. <laughs> but that's not what Jesus is there for, right? Sure, Jesus will change things, but not the way they think that he's going to change things. So now we skip forward to Thursday. And it's Thursday, and Jesus is there with his disciples. And they have a meal. It's the final meal they're going to have for a very long time. 
The disciples mm. just do not know that. Mercy. And they're sitting there and they're all filled up with their pumps and their prides, who's most important and who's not important, who should eat first and who should eat second, who should dip for sup with him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and, and they've eaten. And, and tradition says that the servant should wash the feet of, of the master. And they're finished eating and Jesus gets up. He wraps a towel around his waist. You know the story, you're good Adventist scholars, aren't you? Jesus wraps a towel around his waist, takes a basin and fills it with water. And he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Say yes. what? Jesus, the master, is washing the feet of his disciples. The one who most deserves to have his feet washed is washing the feet of his disciples. This is crazy. <laughs> What's going on here? Peter begins to protest. Lord, no, 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 no. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, then you won't have anything to do with me. Oh, Peter said, then wash me. Bathe my entire body. Dump me in the entire basin, man. Wash everything. No, 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 just your feet, just your feet, Peter. Don't get crazy. I'll just wash your feet, okay? I need to teach you guys a lesson. That's what I'm doing. And here's the lesson. Come on, screen reader. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And then that text that I love so much. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Say what? By this, and only by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. What's Jesus talking about? People will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen. Not if you have degrees in theology or divinity. Not if you can recite biblical texts from memory. Not if you can sing like nightingales. Not if you can quote the writings of Ellen G. White. Not if you can teach Sabbath school classes like law professors. Yeah, I'm making like a plug for law professors here, you know? Amen, amen. <laughs> Not if you can pray fluently and eloquently. Not if you can preach with fervor. Not if you can sing like nightingales. Not if you can conduct evangelistic crusades and baptize thousands of people. No, 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 no. Jesus says, that's not it. People will know you are my disciples if you have love for each other. Amen. If Amen. by extension, you love other people. Hmm. Even those who despise you, you've got to show love. And if you do that, then you people will know you are my disciples. I Amen. call this a love chant. You have a cause, you have a chant. Now Jesus is saying, I want you guys to show love. Mm. I'm not going to be here always. I, I have to leave you guys. Hey, Jesus, where are you going to? Don't worry about it. You can't come where I'm going. <laughs> I have to leave you guys for a while. And while I'm gone, I want you guys to show love. You have to show love to everybody. Show love to people all over this world of yours. And they will know you are my disciples. Show some love. And guess Amen. what? I'll drink to that. Well, that's Amen. just water, okay? That's just water. It's water. It's clear. It's water, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> Take your time, preacher. I, I, I don't sing Calypso anymore. It's only water. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, Jesus says, go out and show some love. If all he wants us to do, show some love. So, here's the big question. What is love? If Jesus wants us to show love, what is love? Have mercy. What is that thing called 
love. We've been wrestling with this for a while. I remember being an 11 year old and thinking that question myself, what is love? And my auntie Jackie was older than I am. And I figured I'd ask my auntie Jackie, what is love? After all, she would know. You know, she, she used to read these books, this Harley Quinn romance novels, you know? <laughs> And she used to read books written by, uh, published by these British publishers, uh, Mills and Boone, you know? Now, I know you guys don't know anything about that, right? Adventist people don't read Harley Quinn novels, right? <laughs> Adventists don't read Mills and Boone, right? Yeah, you've never heard about them, right? No, sir. Right, okay, okay. So Adventists have no clue. Uh, and my Auntie Jackie, she had in her bedroom, she had uh, on the wall, you know, um, pictures of, there's like a young fellow called Michael Jackson. He had this big Afro and bell bottom pants and block hill shoes. You guys don't know who he is, right? <laughs> yeah, there's a Michael Jackson. He had a big brother called Jermaine or something like that. Yeah, she had pictures of him you know on the wall and she used to swoon whenever the, his songs played on the radio oh michael michael you know uh, you know that's a long time ago right mm -hmm. now, now me on on my wall i had pictures of, of a guy called garfield sobers you guys have no clue who garfield sobers is you know but garfield sobers was this great cricketer and so i, I had garfield sobers and there was a guy called mohammed ali he used to be cassius clay when he became mohammed ali i had pictures of that and there was a guy called ray charles you know yeah mm -hmm. He had dark glasses also, Richard. <laughs> yeah. and, and a fellow who had died recently uh, called um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. You know, those are my heroes back then. You know, but, but my aunt, my aunt was into this Michael Jackson fellow and his Jermaine Jackson, and she read the Mills and Boons and Harlequins. You know, so so she knew what love was. So I figured I'd ask my aunt Jackie. Ah, aunt Jackie, tell me something. What is love? And Auntie Jackie told me, love is something you feel when you feel something you've never felt before. Have mercy. That song did like something straight from Aristotle or Plato, you know? <laughs> love is something you feel when you feel something you've never felt before. I like that. As an 11 year old, I began to look forward to the day when I would feel something I had never felt before. That sounded, that sounded really nice, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, I didn't have long to wait. No, no. no. Mercy. Mm -hmm. I was still 11 years old. My granny hadn't died yet. My granny died when I was 11. So my granny was still alive. I wasn't 11. I was still 11 years old when, when it happened. I was practicing for the high jump con competition at DGS. We called it Dominica's Greatest School, DGS, Dominica's Greatest School. I was practicing for the high jump competition and I went over the bar. And as I went over the bar, I fell to the ground. And I saw my left hand went in one direction and my left arm went in the other direction. Have mercy. And, and those four bones in my wrist went crack. And I felt something in my left wrist that I had never felt before. Mercy. I ended up at the hospital. They put a big cast and stayed there for nine long weeks. But I felt something I had never felt before. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I knew then that my Auntie Jackie must have been wrong. Because, because whatever it was, I felt that day when I went the wrong way over the high jump bar, it could not have been love. If that's how love felt, I didn't want a thing to do with it. Mercy. That was too painful. So later on in life, I figured, let me go search for the scripture. Find a meaning for love. 
And that took me to Paul and 1 Corinthians. And I know you guys know this by heart, don't you? You all can close your eyes and you can recite 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Yes? Nobody's answering me? Mercy. Yes. <laughs> Paul tells us what? Love is long suffering. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love is not puffed up. Love rejoices in the truth. Love does not fail. Yes. All these good things about love, right? Amen. See, love is good stuff. Yes. It's not that painful thing, feeling I felt that day I went over the high jump bar the wrong way. And we're focusing on that first one. Love is long suffering. Paul is expanding on what Jesus said. He's expanding upon the Hosanna chant. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for his mercy and just forever. But Paul, if you're doing that, what's that long suffering you're talking about? You're making love song very painful. You're making love song like something we have to bear like a burden. What is that you're talking about? Mercy. Paul says, wait, Paul says, wait, wait, don't go accusing me of bad stuff. Let me explain. Let me explain. No, no, love is not a recipe for a disaster. That's not what I'm talking about. Love does not have to make you suffer. Instead, here's what it means. So you have to show off that I went to seminary, you know? Mercy. You might have to get somebody. The bad thing about getting somebody who went to seminary to come preach at your church is we will have to get some Greek, you know? or Hebrew or Syriac or something, just to show off that we've been to seminary. That's all it is. It is it, not because it helps, we just have to show off. That's all it is. You understand, Elder? Jeez. That's all that's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Paul uses this Greek word, macrophemia. Macrophemia, love is slow to anger. Amen. You guys should repeat that, you know, like we're in class now. I'm a Amen. professor. Love slow is what? Anger. Slow to anger. Come on now, unmute, unmute your microphone. Slow, love is what? Slow, slow to, to anger. anger. No, now I know you guys are with me, right? Love is slow to anger. It's a, Pastor, what are you talking about? Slow to anger. Yeah, sometimes, you know, people really get under your last nerve, right? You Mercy. can admit it, you know. And, and, and then you say, man, I feel like giving you a piece of my mind. Well, anytime somebody tells me that, I say, cool, cool, cool it, cool it, cool it. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Don't give me a piece of your mind. You, know? Mercy. you, you got to hold on to your mind. Be slow to anger, all right? So, so, so be righteously indignant, but don't give me a piece of your mind. So when somebody suppresses your vote, be righteously indignant, but be slow to anger. Have mercy. Mm -hmm. When someone refuses your job because of the color of your skin, be righteously indignant. Plan to do something about it, but be slow to anger. Have mercy. When you get pulled over by the police because you're driving a fancy car, be righteously indignant, but be slow to anger. Amen. This man, I, I do not see well, you know? <laughs> Sometimes I do not see at all. Got myself one of those fancy cars, uh, they drive themselves, you know? Left the office at two o'clock one morning, drove myself, well, the car drove me home, got to my driveway. It reversed itself, neatly packed itself in my garage. I mean, this is a fantastic thing, you know? Put it kind of it reversed. And packed. Sweet. Closed my garage door, go to my home, sat at my table. But 10 minutes later, it had a loud rap on your door. There's a loud rap on your door at 2.30 in the morning. It could only be one thing, right? Mercy. The police. Why is the police rapping on my door at 2.30 in the morning? I'm still dressed in my suit and so on, you know, I'm a lawyer. I go up to the door. Hey, hi guys, what's up? And they instantly recognized me. Like, oh, we're sorry, man, we're sorry. It's like, what's up? We're so ashamed of this, man, we're sorry, but somebody called in that 
but what? what what's up? Yeah, somebody called in that, that you stole a car and and drove it to this address and have mercy. Uh, we, we didn't know it was your address. It's like, oh, okay. So you want to see my car? It's like, well, I guess we should follow protocol. It's like, yeah, I'll open my garage for you. Open the garage. They said, okay, have a good night, man. You know, we're sorry about that. They recognize me, you see. <laughs> Somebody had seen this black man driving this car and figured mm -hmm, he must have stolen it. I was righteously indignant, but I didn't go burn down the neighborhood. Mercy. Didn't do me much good, right? Slow to anger. Are you guys with me? Amen. Slow Amen. to anger. Listen, man. Listen, listen, listen. You got to understand this. We're talking about black history, right? and the struggles of our people in this country. My first day on campus, first day on campus, I'm putting stuff in my office and I walk downstairs mm. and there are four police officers with their guns in their holsters. Understand I come from New York. New York police officers work with little batons, not with guns in the holsters, you know? In New York, you can't do anything to the police. They don't walk with guns in their holsters. But this is Texas. These guys have guns in their holsters. Have mercy. And, and they ask, who are you? I say, I'm Professor James. I just got here from New York. He's like, really, you have to stand here. Someone has to identify you. He's like, what happened? Well, somebody called in a report that there's someone committing a burglary at the law school. Well, <laughs> I have to show off that I know what burglary is, right? I said, burglary is the breaking and entering into a building at night to commit a crime therein. One, it's not nighttime, and two, I'm not committing any crime. I'm putting books in. Ever heard of a burglar putting things in? I've murdered. You know, a burglar, they're taking things out. And they go, ha, 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 you're smart, blah, 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 blah. Right? <laughs> and this guy stood there until someone came out and identified me as a professor. Someone had forgotten to send out a memo that the school had finally hired a black professor. Mercy. But I didn't go burn down the place. You got to be slow to anger. You guys got my drift. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I was righteously indignant. Now there's a difference. There's a fine, fine line between the two. And Paul says, no, that fine, fine line, macrophemia. Because if you cross the fine line, then suddenly you're on the wrong side and suddenly they're trying to persecute you. So you get slow to anger and you get a cause and you chant and you chant and you chant. Mm. Like what Bali would say, you chant down Babylon. Mercy. And I'll drink to that. Amen. I brought enough water today just so I could drink to various things. <laughs> so you chant down Babylon. You break the barriers down with your chanting and your agitating and your demonstrating because you have a cause. Amen. And I didn't invent that. You see, Jesus was part of this. Jesus sitting on his donkey with the people chanting, with the people waving their palm branches because they had a cause. Amen. Amen. So Von James started this. Von James didn't do it. Von James is as much a victim as everybody else, right? And then we find lessons through history of this, this chanting of this macrophemia, which gives power to the people. And our people have had a long history of macrophemia, of powerfully, powerfully yet quietly letting the voices be heard. Let's think of some slaves in Mississippi. Out there in the cotton fields, picking cotton, with no shoes on their feet. And, and, and the bell rings of a horn songs and it's time for lunch. And they're in the line, going up for lunch. And what are they singing? I've got shoes. You've got shoes. All of God's children got shoes. And the slave master is watching them and saying, they've gone crazy. They've got no shoes on. Have mercy. But they're singing, I've got shoes. <laughs> You've got shoes. All of God's children got shoes. But they've got no shoes on. He can see with his eyes that they've got no shoes on. He said, I have some crazy 
people working for me. They're singing, they've got shoes and they have no shoes on. And he turns his back and he walks away saying, these people are crazy. Come give them their potato peel soup so they can go back to picking cotton. And then they face each other and they raise the chorus and say, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna put on my shoes. I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven. Amen. By faith, they could see that they would get shoes one day. Amen. Macrophilia. Amen. Macrophilia. Let's talk about another one. Mr. Willis and his wife, Minerva. They're picking cotton in the hot Alabama sun. And they look in the sky and what do they see? They see the sun, the big orange ball. And it's hot. And what do they think of? They think of the chariot. The chariot that took Elisha, right? And so he writes a song. And now my, my click is not doing here goes. He writes a song. What does he write? Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming far to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming far to carry me home. Take me away from this miserable place. Take me away, macrophobia. Take me away. Take me to a better place. Take me to a better place. Mm. Amen. But he's not burning yeah. down the place. He has that hope, that brilliant hope. Things will change someday, and things changed one day. Yesterday afternoon, I was working on this sermon. Have mercy. I'll confess that last minute. It took me two weeks to work on this sermon. <laughs> mercy, mercy. But yesterday, I was proud. I heard my delegate, I heard my delegate addressing the Senate yesterday. Amen. See, I've heard some people call her Congresswoman Flasket. Yeah, but in the Virgin Islands, we, we're not afforded a Congressperson. We have a delegate to Congress because <laughs> we're a territory in the Virgin Islands, you see? Mm -hmm. We're a territory. Mercy. We, we have American passports, we're American citizens but we cannot vote for the president. We, we, we vote in the primaries, but we cannot vote for the president. No, no, because I, I, I teach in Texas now and I reside in Texas, I, I get to vote for the president. But when I move back to Catherine's Rest, St. Croix, where I have my home, free the Catherine's Rest, St. Croix, that's where I have a home. When I go back there, I won't be able to vote for the president anymore because I'll be living in a territory, you see? I'll be able to vote for my delegate. This is my current delegate, and she was speaking yesterday. And something she said really resonated with me. She said the first time she ran for delegate to Congress, I remember that. The first time she ran, she lost. <laughs> yes. And she said she lost. She didn't start a riot. She didn't march against our legislative building. She didn't march against Congress. She didn't start an insurrection. Mercy. She said she stayed home and slept for three days. Mercy. And then Mercy. she got over it after three days. And life goes on. And then she ran again in 2015 and she won and she's been winning ever since. And so she's still our delegate to Congress. And I, I appreciate our delegate to Congress. Sure, all of you who call her Congresswoman, that's nice. Thanks for elevating her. <laughs> but I, I love our delegate to Congress. Amen. Delegate Plaskett. Some of you guys will get to know her even better. I know nobody knew her before last week. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Remember her face. Remember her name. That's our delegate. We're from the Virgin Islands. I'll say hi to all the Virgin Islanders who are listening. I know there are a few of you all listening today, right here Amen. with us. Amen. <laughs> Macrophemia. She did not start an insurrection because she lost. She picked up the pieces and she went to work all over again. I'm showing you something. I'm getting personal now. In my office, I have a number of certificates on the wall, you know, to make people think I know something. But there are two certificates which mean a lot to me. And I figured I'd take pictures of them and to show you guys today. 
This one is a certificate of manumission. Mm. It tells you that my great great grandmother, a woman called Desiree, on January 3rd, 1827, bought her freedom from slavery. Goodness. Hmm. She was a slave on the estate of uh, Monsieur Louis Talleyrand. Monsieur Talleyrand had come from Brittany in France. And my great great grandmother was a slave. Mercy. And on January 3rd, 1827, she put together one shilling and six pence. And I did the conversion to today's currency. That would be $2,501 US Have currency. Mercy. Mercy. And she bought her freedom from slavery. And in exchange for buying her freedom, Monsieur Talleyrand, who couldn't write, by the way, that's his thumbprint you see at the bottom of the screen there. He put his thumbprint. He gave her this certificate of manumission saying you are now a free woman. And wherever she went, she went, she had to walk with this certificate of manumission. Mercy. So when I graduated from law school at Syracuse, my aunt framed this thing up in this bronze frame that you see. And she gave them to me. She said, Shaky, I want you to have this so you'll never forget your roots. You see the little heart on the side. In my collection of pictures, these are my favorites, you know? So, so it's one of my favorite pictures. I cherish it greatly. It tells me where I came from. Yeah. I know where I came from. Huh. My great, great grandmother, Desiree, a former slave. And when she got off the plantation, she started a new chant, Massa de Don. Mercy. Massa being the master. She would not work for Massa again. Not for a penny, not for a nickel, not for a dime, not for a dollar. She would not work for Massa again. Mm. Never, ever. Desiree went on <laughs> to work for herself. I have all the papers. I have a collection, a stack of papers of how Desiree eventually made money and how I came to right now own lots of land. I do own plenty of land, by the way, <laughs> Come from, from Desiree. And, and, and the way she made her money, I could, I could tell you, but that'd be, that'll take two, three days, you see? I'm gonna show you another certificate. This one has a slavery certificate. That's Desiree's husband. It's also on the wall of my office. The British decided to emancipate their slaves. They passed the Emancipation Act in 1833. And on August 1st, 1834, they set their slaves free. That's before the Americans decided to do it. And on July 31st, 1834, they held a census of all the slaves. This man was Moise. I know you can't see it too well. His name was Moise. And the registry said that on July 31st, 1834, he was a slave on the Marijan estate in the parish of St. Peter on the island of Dominica, La Dominique, in, in what was the French West Indies and became the British West Indies. It was British at the time. He was a slave then. And he was set free on August 1st, 1834. Somehow he met Desiree and he married Desiree. Yep. Well, you know, when he and Desiree got together, they, 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 even before they got together, he joined that group and they had that chant, Massa de Don. I'm not working for Massa anymore. Not for a penny, not for a dime, not for a nickel, not for a dollar. We're going to do things for ourselves. We are free people. We are not working for Massa. Massa de Don. You get a cause. You get a chant, and that was their chant. Amen, amen, amen. And quite importantly for me, of course, is that Desiree got married to Moise. And Moise and Desiree, they begat Mambolo. And Mambolo begat Manchul. And Manchul begat Vila. And Vila begat my mother, Alex, who is currently over there in Dumfries, Virginia, and, and Alex, Begat me. Amen. I know where I came from. 
Talk about black history today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I keep these two things on the wall of my office. I know I'm boasting today. I know where I came from. <laughs> Slave blood, blood runs in my veins. Masadi done. And then there came a time in my life when I joined up the group of people who didn't like to see what was happening to black people. We heard stories of what was happening in America, of Martin Luther King being killed. We heard what was happening in South Africa. And we would go around and grow our Afros. I know, you don't think I used to have an Afro? <laughs> I used to have an Afro, man. Mercy. I even used to have dreadlocks too, you know? And the bell-bottom pants and the block heel shoes. I know, John Ashman, you never had that, you know. <laughs> never had the joy of having the bell bottom pants, the block hill shoes, the afro, and the dreadlocks. No, no <laughs> sir, no, sir. <laughs> I, I, and we would walk about with, with our figure on our neck, with the fists like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And Perfect. then we would raise them in the air and shout, Power to the people! Somebody saying something? Amen. <laughs> power to the people, we would shout, power to the people. <laughs> our reward, of course, used to be to feel the sting of the police batons on our backs. Mercy. And the burning of tear gas in our nostrils and in our eyes. <laughs> oh, those were the days, all right. Power to the people. <laughs> power to the people. And today we hear the new chant. Black Lives Matter. Mercy. Black Lives Matter. Mm. It, it doesn't mean that other lives do not matter. Get that straight. I mean, uh, when people say Black Lives Matter, and then others, oh, blue lives matter, and white lives matter. Sure, white lives matter, and blue lives matter, and green lives matter. But Black Lives Matter. You see, you, you got to be like me. You, you, you got to have somebody see you get into your fancy car and call the police. And the police show up at your home at 2.30 in the morning. Mercy. To, 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 to find out if you stole the car or not. <laughs> Fortunately for me, they know me. I'm just a lawyer, but they know, you know? So they didn't even come check my car. <laughs> I said, my brother, it's so interesting. They didn't even check my car. They walked away apologetic. We're so right. sorry about this, Prof. We're so sorry about this. What if it wasn't Prof? It was somebody else who didn't steal the car, but what the police didn't know the person. What a calamity we'd have had, right? Black Lives Matter. What about that day I came downstairs and there were four police officers with their guns? Who is this man? Well, he's a professor. Black Lives Matter. You understand? Amen. And we have to take this thing seriously. What are we going to do about it? I'm not saying to start an insurrection. I'm not saying to storm the capital. I like Paul's way. Macrothemia. Righteously indignant. But we must chant. <laughs> we must chant. We must stand up. We must fight. I know people think fight means go and have fisticuffs. No, no, no. We got to protest. Yeah. We got to stand up. We got to speak up from the pulpit. If you have power, use the power. Tell people this must stop. It's time for black people in this country to get a better break. Amen. We must be righteously indignant, but be slow to anger. Amen. Amen. Now, we don't have to go burn, burn, burn. We don't have to go destroy, destroy. But we got to stand up for righteousness. Amen. Stand up for righteousness. And that's the message I came to bring here. Power to yeah. the people. Amen. Wow. And, and the amen. way to get power is to walk the Jesus way. Macrophemia. Amen. Father Almighty, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you that we can walk your way. We do not need to destroy. We do not need to fight. We do not need to burn. But we need to stand up for righteousness. We need to love each other. Love ourselves, our spouses, our children, our neighbors. Love even those who would do us harm. 
but let that shining example be in us, the example of Jesus, the example advocated by Paul, and let others come to know the Jesus way through our example. We ask for his mercies in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.